A few days ago, the Lord put on my heart to explain why we so carefully word page 23 of our tracks. That is where it presents the reader with the steps to getting saved. Of course, this is highly controversial. It has to do with repentance in salvation. Are there more than one type of repentance in Scripture? If so, how can we know which is which? And how does that affect what's on page 23 of our tracks? You may want the subtitles on for this, and you may want to get your Bible and check the verses for yourself. Hi, I'm David Daniels for Chick Publications. Why do we have the word repent in our tracts at all? First, is repentance important? I take seriously the verses of Scripture that mention all the world or all men must repent, meaning all men and women and young people who are above the age of accountability. Here are five verses where repentance is taught for all people, both Jews and Gentiles. Number one, Acts 11, 18. Quote, When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. End quote. These are Hebrew Christians, apostles and elders, realizing God has granted to Gentiles repentance unto life. End quote. Number two. Acts 17.30, quote, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, end quote. I cannot get around all men everywhere. If all men everywhere do not repent, all men everywhere are not obeying God's commandment. I'm just showing what the scripture says. Number three, Paul testified to the elders of Ephesus how he held back nothing from them that was profitable, teaching publicly and house to house. Acts 20.21, 20, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, end quote. Note the direction toward, repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Both Jews and Greeks had to repent toward God and have faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, when Paul testified to King Agrippa, he told what he had done in response to the heavenly vision of Jesus. Acts 26, 20, But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works, meet for repentance. End quote. Jews and Gentiles should Repent and turn to God, period. Then after they're saved, they should do, do works, meet, appropriate, for repentance. Those works follow the repentance after they're saved. In that light, God said through Paul in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, quote, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death." End quote. So repentance is not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow comes before repentance. Quote, godly sorrow worketh repentance. End quote. Number five. 
2 Peter 3, verse 9. God said through the Apostle Peter, quote, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, end quote. God wants all to come to repentance. God didn't even mention faith there. But here's the bottom line. Whatever repent means, all men everywhere, both Jews and Gentiles, are commanded to do it. Here's what we find in these five verses about repentance. One, it's granted by God, Acts 11.18. Two, it's commanded by God, Acts 17.30. Three, it is repentance toward God, Acts 20.21. Four, it goes with faith toward Jesus Christ, Acts 20.21. Five, it goes with turning to God, Acts 20.21. Six, it comes before doing works, meet for repentance, also Acts 20.21. Seven, the Lord is willing that all should come to repentance, Second Peter 3, verse 9. If we take out repentance, we are missing something that God commands all men everywhere to do. But people tell us to take it out of our tracks. According to these scriptures, are we obeying God if we take repentance out of our tracks? Or would we be making what people want more important than what God says? You can decide for you. I'm talking about me here. One day, I have to stand before Jesus and explain what I did with his words. I don't want to say that I used my theology to justify disobeying God's words. That's why you don't see me thumbing through theology books. I'm going through the book very carefully. I don't want to make a mistake on something as important as this. So you see, we want to obey and tell people to repent as God said. But that leads us to the next point. First, is repentance important? Yes. Second, what is repentance? I've gone over every verse on repentance in the scriptures, and I see three kinds that have to do with God and man. Type one is God's repentance. When God repents, he turns from what he said he would do, for good or for ill, based on humans' response to him. Jeremiah 18, verses 7 to 10, quote, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good Wherewith, wherewith I said I would benefit them. End quote. When God repents, he turns from what he said he would do, for good or for ill, based on humans' response to him. That is type one, God's repentance. Type two is unsaved man's repentance. 
By man, God means everyone created from Adam onward, male and female. Unsaved humans repent toward God by turning from their state of unbelief and whatever they trusted in, in their sinful state. From that, they turn to trust Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ described it like this. John 3, verses 14 to 15, quote, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life, end quote. Jesus compared himself to the serpent lifted up on the pole in the wilderness. That's in Numbers 21, verses 7 to 9. People were bitten by fiery serpents. God said, quote, that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. That's like what we find in Isaiah 45, 22, quote, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else, end quote. So they had to turn to look unto, behold, the serpent on the pole. We have to turn from whatever we're trusting in or are wrapped up in to look unto Jesus. Turning from our sinful state and whatever we're trusting in to turn toward Jesus to trust him, that's repentance type two. Turning and looking upon leads to life. In Numbers 21, it led to physical life. In the gospel, it leads to eternal life. Now, some say repentance means listing off all your sins to God. Do we have to list off all our sins in order to be saved? That's impossible. Dealing with individual sins is repentance type 3. Repentance type 3 is only for saved people. Unsaved people can list off sins to their heart's content, but it won't save them. However, at the time of conversion, when God convicts someone's heart, there can be specific sins that the Holy Ghost may bring up, but that's between him or her and God. I have no right to judge that. I'll let God deal with them. In Acts 9.4, in Saul's con conversion, Jesus brought a specific sin directly before him. Acts 9.4, quote, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? End quote. Though I'm sure that was not Saul's only sin. But what if in that time of conviction before God, people do list off sins? Does that mean they got saved by works? People have actually told me this. No. That's their human response to the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. In John 16, 7 to 8, Jesus said, quote, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and and of righteousness, and of judgment. End quote. After Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Ghost with a job to do, to reprove the world. Reprove means show what you did wrong. Other Bible verses say rebuke, convince, tell him his fault, even convict. The Holy Ghost's job is to reprove the world of three things. 1. Sin. John 16, 9, quote, of sin because they believe not on me, end quote. We are sinners, and the biggest sin is to refuse to believe on Jesus Christ. If we don't believe on Jesus Christ, we cannot have our sins forgiven. 2. Righteousness. John 16, 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Jesus was the perfect example of righteousness. Everything not like Jesus is unrighteous. And Jesus told us what righteousness is. Since Christ ascended to heaven, 
He sent the Holy Ghost to do the job with every man, woman, boy, and girl on earth. Through the gospel, the Holy Ghost convicts us that Jesus is absolutely righteous, and we are sinners. And because of that, three, judgment. John 16, 11, quote, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The Holy Ghost brings to mind the coming judgment day. Satan is going down, but so is anyone else who refuses to put his or her faith in Christ Jesus. What do the Holy Ghost's reproofs do? You're convicted, just like in a court of law. God has every right to sentence you to hell and the lake of fire. What is our response? Do we simply repeat some words so the punishment goes away? Or do we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy? Because he shed his blood for our sins, to pay the price for us, to be forgiven and go to heaven. In many people, that is an emotional moment. I hope so. It affects where you will spend eternity. What do you do as a soul winner? What do you want a lost soul to do? To be serious with God at this point. Right here, I must tell you a story. Years ago, a Baptist minister from Vista, a city north of San Diego, had lunch with Jack Chick and me over at our Chick-fil-A. He told us how he loved our Chick tracks and he contrasted them with something that happened to him some years earlier. He was with a bunch of guys who were out saving souls. Or so they said. They had their clipboards in hand, and they went from house to house asking questions of the people. So far, so good. But when they asked people questions, they checkmarked off their answers, then at some point led the person in a prayer of some sort. The minister told us about this one house that really opened his eyes. There was a man mowing his lawn. He didn't even slow down the whole time. The guy with a clipboard read down his list, and the mowing guy just grunted. And the man checked another item on his clipboard. So it went like this. Blah, 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 grunt, check mark. Blah, 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 grunt, check mark. Finally, it came time to the salvation prayer. Clipboard guy didn't miss a beat. He didn't even wait. Once he got the grunt at the right spot, he went into the salvation prayer, and the guy on cue grunted. Or at least clipboard guy said he did. Then he walked away saying something like, we got another one. Brothers and sisters, a precious soul is not a check on a clipboard. This is far worse than any one, two, three, repeat after me stories I've heard. That was a swindle. A con. That was a check on the clipboard. It did nothing for the mowing guy, except maybe sour him to the gospel. Can you hear him? If that's all there is to their belief, they can have it. And if that is all that was to his belief, I'd agree with him. Some Christian workers in the name of evangelism are too prone to pump up the numbers instead of looking for people who actually want to be saved and are convicted having been reproved of the Holy Ghost. If we really believe the scriptures that the Holy Ghost, the comforter of John 14 to 16, acts on the heart of the unsaved, what would be the result? If God the Holy Ghost convicted you, you would be convicted, just like in a court of law, but the Holy Ghost acts on the heart. If you had an encounter with God, the almighty and powerful and holy God, and he showed you your sinfulness, Jesus Christ's righteousness, and the coming judgment, wouldn't you feel just a little unclean? Peter got the smallest whiff of who Jesus was. And what happened? Quote, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me! For I am a sinful man, O Lord, end quote, Luke 5, 8. 
Isaiah got a vision of Christ on the throne. Quote, then it said, I, woe is me, for I am undone because of a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, end quote, Isaiah 6, 5. We put one simple way to check the status of that soul in step two. Question, is that soul under conviction or not? And it's really simple. Are they willing to deal with their sins? That can only be done by a saved person. That's type three repentance. Only saved people get to deal with sins with their loving and faithful father. But if the person is not even willing to repent, then he or she is not ready to be saved. When Jesus went to heal people, he didn't heal those who were not willing. John 5, verse 6, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said, saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? End quote. When the blind man called out to Jesus, Jesus responded, Luke 18, 41, quote, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? End quote. And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. They were powerless to help themselves, but Jesus asked them what they wanted, and they knew what they wanted, and they told him. But some people say, isn't being willing a work? Scripture has the answer. I read to you about God already. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, end quote. But does God being willing that they all come to repentance make them all come to repentance? No, but it is an open door. It's just like Jesus talking to the paralytic by the pool and the blind man by Jericho. He asked them what they willed, but they were powerless to do it. Oh, but God is powerful. Even Paul willed a good work, but he was powerless to perform it. Romans 7, verse 18, quote, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. End quote. Paul could will all he wanted, but that didn't make him perform the good. So being willing isn't a work by any stretch of the imagination. It's simply the open door to the possibility of good works. But if a person is not willing to turn from his or her sins, that person is not yet ready to be saved from his or her sins. So just because someone puts up a web page and redefines our words, it doesn't mean we left the gospel. It means instead that he made us say something we never did. He will have to deal with that with Jesus. And Jesus won't look at that website. Jesus will look at his heart. God bless you and have a wonderful day.